Although we'll be discussing the important role radiology and medical imaging play towards improving health outcomes in low-income countries, it's very important to appreciate the context in which this talk is occurring. And that's in a setting where more basic healthcare issues also simultaneously need to be better addressed. Issues like clean water, better nutrition, better housing, and better delivery of medical treatments. So why do I believe it's important to discuss the role of medical imaging in low-income countries? Well, there's traditionally always been a relatively strong focus on striving to improve the delivery of primary care, obstetrics, surgical services, and medical treatments in low-income countries, but sometimes an underappreciation for how much these services and treatments rely on diagnostic imaging to be effective. Without X-ray imaging capabilities, you can't tell if a patient's TV treatment might be working. Without ultrasound imaging capabilities, you might not be able to monitor pregnancies well. Without CT imaging capabilities, you can't tell if a patient may need surgery to intervene on internal bleeding after an accident. Public health in these nations rely on medical imaging and radiology, and critical access issues exist in many low-income countries. To better appreciate the state of medical imaging in low-income countries, we'll focus on five topics. The spectrum and overall burden of disease in low-income countries vis-a-vis middle-income and high-income countries. The essential imaging requirements in low-income countries. Physical capital and human capital issues low-income countries face. And finally, potential solutions folks are proposing to improve access to medical imaging and radiology in low-income countries. When compared to the United States, low-income countries experience a different spectrum of disease and a higher overall burden of disease. To better appreciate this, we'll first look at how relative death rates from six different causes vary around the world. Deaths from TB, influenza and pneumonia, HIV AIDS, birth trauma, traffic accidents, and violence. The first three items on this list are infectious diseases and sometimes behave synergistically as lung cancers are one of the most important causes of morbidity and mortality in patients with HIV AIDS. We'll begin with TB and look at how relative death rates from TB compare between low-income countries, particularly those in Africa and Central Asia, versus high-income countries in regions like the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and Japan, and also versus the middle-income BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Relative death rates from TB in Africa are substantially higher than in most of the world, and at 127 deaths per 100,000 people is over a thousand times higher than in the United States. Relative death rates from TB in middle-income BRICS countries vary greatly, ranging from high in India to moderately high in Russia to moderately low in China and in Brazil. Relative death rates from influenza and pneumonia are also dramatically higher than in high-income countries, China and Russia. Relative death rates from HIV AIDS are dramatically higher in Africa than in most high and middle income countries. Relative death rates from birth trauma in low income countries are substantially higher than in most high and middle income countries. Relative death rates from traffic accidents in low income countries are substantially higher than in most high and middle income countries. Relative death rates from violence in low-income countries are also substantially higher than in most high- and middle-income countries, with the noticeable exceptions of Brazil, Russia, and the United States. The U.S. is an outlier amongst high-income countries and sees significantly higher relative death rates from violence than practically any other high-income country, China or India. Now let's look at relative death rates from five other causes which are generally perceived to be amongst the leading killers in high-income countries, coronary artery disease, stroke, all cancer, lung cancer, and breast cancer. If we look at coronary heart disease, which is the number one cause of death here in the U.S., it's readily apparent that relative death rates from coronary heart disease are in comparison substantially higher in most low-income countries and middle-income countries than in the United States. 
Relative death rates from coronary heart disease are two and a half times higher in Africa, twice as high in India, and almost three times higher in Russia than in the U.S. Relative death rates from stroke in low-income countries are substantially higher than in most high-income countries. Middle-income BRICS countries like China and Russia also experience dramatically higher relative death rates from stroke than most other high-income and other middle-income countries. Relative death rates in low-income countries from all cancers combined are generally lower than in most high-income and middle-income countries. Some of the highest relative death rates from all cancers combined currently occur in China, Russia, and Eastern Europe. If we look at different types of cancers, however, a more heterogeneous picture emerges. Take lung cancer. The lowest relative death rates from lung cancer are encountered in low-income countries in Africa and Central Asia, while the highest relative death rates in the world from lung cancer occur in the United States, Europe, Russia, and in China. It's a different story, however, with breast cancer. With the exception of Russia, which sees some of the highest relative death rates from breast cancer in the world, relative death rates from breast cancer appear to be relatively heterogeneous when your lens is low-income countries or even high-income countries. Looking at all of these statistics, we learn that, number one, the spectrum of disease in low-income countries is different than in high-income countries. Fetal newborn conditions, infectious diseases, road accidents, and HIV AIDS are, relatively speaking, among the leading causes of morbidity and mortality. And number two, the overall disease burden is higher across the board in low-income countries. While heart disease may kill 79 in 100,000 people in the United States, where it's the top cause of death, heart disease kills two and a half times more people per 100,000 in a country like Nigeria, where it's not even the top cause of death. Compared to low-income and high-income countries, we also see that the picture in middle-income countries um, may be complex. Why disparities in personal income exist in many middle-income countries like India, China, and Russia, which can contribute to a substantial bifurcation in health outcomes, where populations with high personal income resemble populations in high-income countries from a public health perspective, while populations with low personal income resemble folks in low-income countries from a public health perspective. This can put middle-income countries in a tricky bind, where leaders need to address both critical issues like TB, malaria, neonatal death rates, and also things like cancer and COPD, all in the context of an often compromised healthcare market. Now, let's talk about what the essential medical imaging requirements of most low-income countries are. We've learned that five of the most pressing healthcare issues in low-income countries are tuberculosis, AIDS-related lung infections, maternal infant health, trauma, and breast cancer. While the complete medical imaging arsenal is composed of these five major imaging modalities, the WHO estimates that X-ray and ultrasound alone can probably address 80 to 90% of diagnostic situations in low-income countries which probably isn't surprising when you consider that x-rays are an important tool in the diagnosis of many traumatic injuries, TB, and lung infections in the setting of HIV AIDS. And that ultrasound is an important tool in the assessment of fetal and neonatal problems, not to mention some breast and vascular issues too. Plus, ultrasound can be a very useful tool for guiding procedures that need to be done to treat patients with some of these conditions. And that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what you can do with just a combination of x-ray and ultrasound imaging. Besides conditions directly associated with trauma, TB, and lung infection, chest x-rays can help diagnose other conditions like pleural effusions, emphysema, asthma, occupational lung disease, and heart failure in resource-constrained settings. In the case of pneumothoraces, pleural effusions, and hemothoraces, chest x-rays are also an important means of identifying immediate post-procedure complications. Besides conditions directly associated with trauma, bone x-rays can also help diagnose conditions like osteomyelitis and some dietary deficiencies that affect the bones in resource-constrained settings. Besides conditions directly associated with aesthetics and with trauma, ultrasound can help diagnose common conditions like cholecystitis, hydronephrosis, and abdominal masses in resource-constrained settings. In the chest, not only does ultrasound help diagnose conditions directly related to trauma, 
It's a versatile tool in diagnosing cardiovascular conditions too, including DVT, heart failure, cardiac valvular disease, and pericardial effusions, not to mention some other orthopedic and neurological conditions too. Besides diagnosis, ultrasound is also a valuable tool for guiding many common medical procedures in resource-constrained settings. So the essential medical imaging requirements of most low-income countries can be pretty modest. Access to modalities such as x-ray and ultrasound alone can be dramatic game changers. So let's talk about the physical capital involved in improving access to x-ray and ultrasound imaging in low-income countries. According to the WHO, two-thirds of the world's population have no access to basic medical imaging, which they define as x-ray and ultrasound. And this is a situation that hasn't changed meaningfully in decades. Even where x-ray or ultrasound are available, quality and safety to patient or to staff can often be questionable. Availability alone does not equate to access, and the WHO has in fact formally defined access to medical imaging as medical imaging that fulfills six criteria. Medical imaging must be available. The x-ray or ultrasound equipment needs to be physically purchased or acquired by a facility and working. Medical imaging must be affordable. The x-ray or ultrasound imaging services need to be both, co most, um, both cost effective for the patient and the healthcare facility providing it. Medical imaging must be accessible. Patients must be geographically in reach of the x-ray or ultrasound machine. Medical imaging must be appropriate. The x-ray or ultrasound equipment must be applied in a scientifically valid application, addresses local needs, and used in an affordable manner. Meaning that plopping down a 3 Tesla MRI may not necessarily be appropriate. Medical imaging must be acceptable provided in a way that respects cultural beliefs and individual attitudes. Finally, medical imaging must be of quality, safe and efficacious to the patient and safe to the patient providing it. Low-income countries may face challenges in achieving these criteria. For example, affordability. While the average cost of an x-ray or an ultrasound exam is substantially less expensive than for advanced imaging studies, these costs can be quite substantial if your average monthly income may be under 86 US dollars, where national healthcare systems are often poorly funded and where little or no health insurance may exist. Accessibility can also be a significant problem in low-income countries. What imaging equipment that is available tends to be clustered in urban locations and where the wealthiest folks live, which can leave the majority of people underserved. For example, a person living in rural Nepal may need to travel one or two days and sacrifice up to one month's income just to get an x-ray or ultrasound. Even if folks in low-income countries could afford the x-ray or ultrasound, they might not always be able to afford to take the time off to travel for the study, which contributes to more delayed diagnoses, more costly treatment when they finally are diagnosed, and poorer health outcomes. The maintenance of x-ray and ultrasound equipment is often also a problem in low-income countries. It's estimated that between 50 and 70% of x-ray equipment and at least 40% of ultrasound equipment in low-income countries are not fully functional. And the cause is not necessarily poor maintenance either. Since much of this equipment may have been do uh, donated when end of life, um, if a part breaks, a replacement part may not always be obtainable. Infrastructure can be an obstacle in low-income countries. Not only are electrical grids sometimes unreliable, with wide voltage fluctuations that could damage electrical gear, the form of energy, or electricity, um, some x-ray machines require may not always be readily available. X-ray machines are often built with modern hospitals in mind, and modern tertiary hospitals often run on three-phase power, where three alternating currents are provided out of phase of each other, unlike conventional residential AC current. Poor roads can impair travel, and service support may be limited. And even if equipment is working perfectly, inadequate IT systems and network bandwidth can impair the use of medical images that are successfully created. And then there's the matter of QC. In some low-income countries, national guidelines may not exist for medical imaging. Um, 
and constraints in resources, physical, human, and in demands um, uh, may make SOPs and safety norms challenging to implement. Low-income countries also face an uphill battle when it comes to human capital. There's a major shortage of radiologist technologists to take X-ray and ultrasound images, and also of radiologists to interpret those X-ray and ultrasound images. Technologists, medical school, and radiology residency programs are scarce, and many locations are, in, are unable to financially reimburse the few technologists and radiologists who are around. To put the shortage of radiologists into perspective, consider that while there's less than one radiologist serving every million people in Liberia, there's over 125 radiologists working at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston alone. A shortage of radiologists exists in many middle-income countries as well. While radiologists are less scarce than in low-income countries, radiologists in middle-income countries are often still in such high demand that they can often choose positions that favor the interpretation of more profitable CT and MRI studies instead of bread and butter modalities like X-ray or ultrasound. In addition, in India, the availability of ultrasound imaging has been further constricted by the Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act, which has had unintended consequence of creating significant bureaucratic barriers to ultrasound use unrelated to prenatal diagnostics. These sort of marketing uh, market and regulatory headwinds have exacerbated the shortage of radiologists interpreting X-ray and ultrasound images in middle-income countries too. So, how can we overcome some of the obstacles standing in the way of medical imaging access in most low-income and many middle-income countries? In a perfect world, enacting new government policies, modifying the distribution of public spending, training more medical professionals, and making large investments in infrastructure could work. Experience and history tell us, however, that accomplishing meaningful change within a reasonable time frame would be extraordinarily difficult with many of these strategies. So folks have been looking at more feasible strategies instead. Many of these strategies aim to grow the physical capital involved for medical imaging and to expand the capacity and capability for interpreting medical images. Expanding humanitarian efforts is a start. Um, that can mean physical capital, like donated radiology equipment, or human capital, like volunteer radiologists. We've seen a move in this direction in some American radiology residencies, in fact, like at Penn, where radiology residents participate in increasingly formalized rotations overseas. Nonprofit humanitarian efforts are a good start, but larger and longer term strategies are also needed, such as more aggressively training local medical imaging entrepreneurs. Investments in business leadership and administrative teaching can help create local imaging entrepreneurs who are more likely to succeed, mitigate risks, lower costs, stay in business, and improve health outcomes in low income countries. This goes hand in hand with helping low income countries secure better access to capital and financing for medical imaging and incentivizing vendors to develop X ray and ultrasound hardware that's better crafted for low income countries from the get go. Starting from engineering decisions like housing complex circuitry elements in casing that's more resistant to water and physical damage, to building machines that function with simple maintenance and with, straight, uh, with straightforward troubleshooting manuals usable by non-technicians. With ultrasound machines, systems that have the power requirements of a laptop, particularly ones that can be charged and can work off of a battery, work much better than conventional ultrasound units. In fact, a new emerging class, emerging class of ultrasound devices powered by smartphones, such as solutions from Butterfly, may be a game changer. Strategies for expanding the, capac the capacity and capability to interpret medical imaging may start with leaning on academic radiology programs in places like the U.S. to provide more resources to existing radiologists from low-income countries by providing more opportunities for training stateside to providing on-site direct instruction to expanding sponsorships to academic conferences. Continuing to expand the pool of non-radiologists trained to do and interpret bread and butter medical imaging 
and make substantial inroads towards um, overcoming the critical shortage of radiologists in low-income countries. Towards this end, the WHO has established ultrasound training recommendations for GPs and for midwives. WHO ultrasound uh, training requ uh, recommendations for non-radiologist MDs is currently 300 to 500 ultrasound exams tailored to local disease patterns, while for midwives is currently 250 abdominal ultrasounds, 50 pelvic ultrasounds, 50 first trimester ultrasounds, and 200 second or third trimester ultrasound exams. Digital imaging and teleradiology can also help by decentralizing the interpretation of medical imaging studies. If the IT infrastructure hurdles can be successfully tackled, digital imaging and teleradiology have the potential to leverage the economies of scale, broadening access to experienced radiologist interpretations, and enabling quite effective QA and QC for low-income countries. But the bandwidth requirements will be substantial. Finally, don't underestimate the potential of technologies like artificial intelligence, smartphones, and social networking to entirely transform how medical imaging interpretation may just play out in low-income countries in the future. So that's an overview of where things stand with medical imaging and radiology in low-income countries. And we'll close with these six take-home points.